going to be in Luke uh, 14. <coughs> Luke chapter 14. We're still pursuing the kingdom of God, and this will be our last class in the course of the four Gospels. Class number 20. Did you redo that one, or is it good? Luke 14 and verse, start at verse 15. And when one of them <coughs> that sat eating with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. <coughs> All right, so Jesus has been talking, and we saw that in chapter 13, and we'll see... <coughs> We'll see it even in front of this here. But I wanted to start with that one because Jesus is sharing, and apparently uh, they were sitting down eating because it says, and when one of them that sat eating with him <coughs> heard these things. So his response to Jesus talking about the kingdom was, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Okay, so it's basically um, blessed is that special person that gets to sit down and eat bread in the kingdom. Now Jesus isn't talking about, when he talks about the kingdom, he's, he's talked about it in terms of a government, not an external government, but an internal government that the same nature um, governs each one. And that's, you know, I mean, Jesus could have just saved us all, right? Jesus could have come down here, died, got, been the sacrifice for our sins, and just left, and that was it. But there was one other step that he took that, why would he have to do that if salvation was the only point? He came inside of each of us. I mean, he could have just saved us and left. You know, you're saved, you know, you know good luck. You know. <laughs> but he came on the inside of all of us. Now, that's, that's a remarkable thing if you think about it. Because, number one, that, that the very life of God could dwell in us. Number two, that it wouldn't just dwell in us like there's this little person called God somewhere inside of me, but rather he dwells in us by his spirit and his nature. And, uh, and that uh, like with Israel, which was a type and shadow, <coughs> well, when they got saved, when they came out of Egypt, you remember the thing, God saved them and they were saved. But then at a certain juncture, God came down and dwelt in the Shekinah glory with them. You understand? Well, he, he didn't have to do that. You know, he could have just said, you're my people. Keep, pray keep the prayers going. You know, I'm up here and I got you covered. But he didn't do that. <clears throat> but still, in that Shekinah glory, he was only in proximity to them. He was not in them but for us Christ in you is the hope of glory Colossians 1 27 that's our hope that's his hope it's interesting to put it that way isn't it it's uh, Christ in us is our hope amen Christ in us is God's hope too what he's hoping for is to get Christ out of us okay all right so uh I'll read this sentence. In verse 15, the man thinks that it's only a, a blessed, special person who gets to sit down and eat in the kingdom of God. Uh, in the next verse, Jesus presents the kingdom in terms of a feast or all eating what the master eats. Um, so uh, verse, let's go ahead and read verse 16. And this is Jesus' response to, to the, what the man said. Then said he unto him, a certain man gave a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time 
to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. Okay, so you see that? They're, they're all in one accord, in one place. And that's what a lot of Christians are after. Well, we just all want to be in one accord, in one place. Well, they're in one accord, but it's the wrong accord. It's a Honda Accord or something like that. <laughs> but it's not a Jesus Accord, okay? <clears throat> and um, and these, all, these all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And then another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly and to the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Notice that now he's going to the weak, and uh, remember, not many noble, not many wise hath God chosen. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world. For what purpose? To confound the wise, that's what it says. The weak things, the small things, the things that seem to be least and yet Jesus became the least, and from that rose again and became the greatest, like that mustard seed. To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? It is likened unto a mustard seed, that after it is sown into death, becomes greater than all other seeds. So, um, in verses 17 through 20, they made excuse because it conflicted with them bettering themselves, meaning I got a yoke of oxen, I got a new field, I got this and that. Um, it took away from time that could be spent promoting their own cause. You know, I have this and I need to do this. I have this and I need to do this. I, I have this and I need to do this. Um, Now, that one in verse 18 has always killed me. I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. Who buys a piece of ground and doesn't check it out first? <laughs> Sorry, that's just a, it's a real estate question for the Lord. <clears throat> but I, but, but the, the, the truth is, it's just an excuse. That's the deal. And... What we have to see is, there, and we have to see this clearly, there is not a problem with owning land. There is not a problem with having something to plow your field with. There's not a problem with getting married. There's not a problem with that. The problem is when all of that is centered in I, and that's what they all used, didn't they, over and over, I, I, I. Um, and again, it's not overt selfishness that we're talking about here. I must needs go kill somebody because I like his shoes. That's overt selfishness. Can, you, <laughs> can I get amen? <laughs> but, but to Jesus, selfishness in any form, is not his government, it's not his kingdom, it's not him ruling in us, it's us wanting what we want, okay? And so what they're doing is they're saying, you know, and remember now, this is, this is likened, the kingdom is being likened unto this great supper. So the kingdom is those that sit down and eat what God eats. They're not, they don't have their own meals. They don't have their own thing going they're trying to commune with him on what pleases him what satisfies him well christ satisfied him this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased this is what i want you know and and so and, he, and god points it out i mean he opens the heavens he speaks 
you know, first time with an open heaven, and it's about his son. And then he does it again on the Mount of Transfiguration. Each time trying to get us to know that out of all of the centuries and that have passed, um, when he shows up like that, he's trying to say there's one thing that is above everything else that pleases my heart, my beloved son, Jesus. We could, we could all go, you know, we could, I, can you imagine him, John, baptizing Jesus, and Jesus comes up out of the water, and, the, you know, all the people are around, and the heavens open, and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And all the people that were watching the baptism and also had been baptized or will be baptized were standing there, and they go, what? You don't like us? That's Jewish, by the way. <laughs> what? You know? <clears throat> Is there a problem with us? What? Did we offend you in some way? Or, what? you know? Here's the deal. It would be if, if God really explained his heart, he'd say, look, here's the deal. That's my beloved son, and I want him in every one of you. That's what Christianity is. We get born again by another life. We receive the life of the Father's good pleasure. And then after getting saved, we spend our time seeking to conform to his image. We spend our time, as we have talked in last class, desiring more of Jesus, less of me. We spend our time when we see something, uh, you know, did you, do you realize that as a Christian, you can sort of, after, I'm going to put it like this, after 10 years of being a Christian, you have the potential of pretty much, you know, defeating all of the really yucky habits you had as a sinner. Right? I'm talking about smoking and cussing and, you know, just carrying on or whatever, you know, I mean, I'm just using examples. Uh, you know, you could, you could defeat all of those and, and after 10 years go, you know, hey, I really don't sin a whole lot or whatever, you know. But to God, smoking or drinking or cussing or any of that stuff is not any different than anything else, including bad attitudes towards somebody that, you know, somebody walks in the room and, they got something on their mind, they walk past you and you go, well, they think there's something. They didn't even acknowledge me. Well, that, you know, that, that smells worse than smoking. <laughs> to God, anyway, <laughs> you know. So we, make, so we make all those outward things so bad and God's trying to clean up the inward, Amen. you know. And uh, I, I, honestly, I don't think he's near as worried about those things because those things take care of themselves as we grow in Christ, don't they? They do. They take care of themselves. We don't have to wrestle with those beasts. Those beasts will beat us. You know what I mean? But there will be a time when they won't by Christ. But these other things we allow, we justify, then begin they to make excuse and to justify. It's, it says that somewhere here, and I'll have to find it for you. Um, all right, so they, it took away from time that could be spent promoting their own cause. Then Jesus, in his example, shows that the kingdom is not based upon the noble, the best out of the crowd, the most honored. Because he goes, okay, if they're not coming in, and they're not going to come in because this is taking away from their self-promotion, then I'll find the weak and the hungry and the, the blind that want to see Jesus. You know what? I mean, that's the real story of the blind getting sick. I mean, open the blind eyes is a great thing, but I think there's a greater thing. When you really have never, you've lived your whole life and you've never seen Jesus, and God opened your eyes, and you see Jesus. Now that, because that's the first, you know, when he laid hands on them or whatever, that's the first thing they saw. They went, <gasps> you know, that, now that, to me, that's special, you know. 
that special. <clears throat> and so, <coughs> so Jesus says, look, and that's what, that's what, that's who gathered unto him when he walked this earth. That's the ones that were open to him. The Pharisees, the know-it-alls, the religious leaders, you know, and I say that, I mean, I'm a pastor. I'm a religious leader. That includes me if I get in the way. It does. You know, they're, you know, standing in the way of, of people getting to Jesus, trying to have people follow them. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus. That's the goal. And I, you know, I just want to be a follower myself. You know, I, I obey him and what he's told me to do to pastor. But in my heart, I'm just a little sheep. I'm just a little lamb that wants Jesus. I feel that way. I genuinely do. I, I feel like, you know, I'm still running behind him going, I just want you. I just want you, Jesus. I just want to be with you, you know. And he's got these long Jesus steps, and I'm this little lamb going, my feet can't keep up with me. <laughs> but his grace is abundant. And it's abundant toward those who, who are not promoting themselves. If God promotes you, and it gets into all that stuff, you know, these, the scriptures that we're uh, going to cover, <coughs> he'll take care of those things. So <coughs> Jesus, Jesus immediately turns and speaks to the crowd as to which category they fall into. This is uh, verse, uh, where are we at? Oh, verse 27, how about this? And <clears throat> whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So there's a lot of different ways of taking the words of Jesus. Can I get an amen? Okay, so if you're a Catholic and you're a monk, you go, okay, well, this means that I have to not get married and I have to uh, eat, you know, like, I'm thinking bark. I don't know. Maybe, I, don't know. I don't know. I'm not a monk. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, and live, you know, and live in this uh, monastery, and you know, and you know, beat yourself with stuff and all this kind of stuff. That's what they take that as. And and there's a multitude of ways to take this. But honestly, and I'm just asking you honestly to consider the context of the flow. And the flow, Jesus is not telling you to, okay, you know, you know, put down your boom box and take up your cross. You know, he's not. He's, he's saying, take up this cross into your walk. Walk crucified. Walk as one with the crucified. You know? That's what he desires most. That's what his heart is. And if we do, then life comes out of death. Then gain comes out of loss. Then what? Then the kingdom of God manifests itself. Because that is the manifestation of the kingdom of God. Um, so I wrote, those who follow Christ crucified are the ones who enter into the kingdom proper. Meaning the, the uh, sheepfold. Thank you that we drew over here because they are sheep they're his sheep they know his voice and they enter into that not because it's a rule or because it's what Christians do it's Christian duty or da 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 but because he has a voice similar to theirs he's the lamb of God we're God's flock and we hear his selfless voice that gave himself and Jesus said that Jesus said you know my sheep know my voice and everything and he said I'm I'm the good shepherd why because I have the biggest flock in town I'm a you know the word shepherd and pastor are the same word do you realize that so I'm the I'm the good pastor well, what makes you that because I got the biggest flock around I'm a good one I'm I'm a good one I could you can't how could I not be a good one with this many people? Hmm, I don't know. Maybe. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> but, you know, he said, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for you. 
and you're going to be sheep in Israel. You're going to lay down your life also for others. This is what we do. <laughs> All right. Let's see. I want to. Okay. Um, in, uh, you know, I really skipped a, a part here that was so good, but. But you have a Bible, don't you? You can go back and read it. If the Lord so direct. Okay, let's skip over to Luke 16. And let's look at verse 16. The law, this is Jesus speaking, 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Okay, so, so what is he saying? Now, this is Jesus talking. This is Jesus saying. He goes, all right, look, up until John, uh, <clears throat> uh, the law and the prophets were preached. And he says, but now, when it comes to preaching, we're preaching the kingdom of God. We're preaching that we want to be governed by Christ. And we're preaching that we're all trying to press into it. This is our goal. Well, I thought our goal was go into all the world and preach the gospel and get people saved. Well, first of all, he didn't say go into all the world and preach the gospel and get them saved. He says go into all the world and preach the gospel and, and make disciples. That's what it says. Okay, well, disciples are those who take up their cross. If any man follow me, you see, but taking up your cross is not, I'm going to quit my job, and I'm going to go to India. You know, good luck at that. You know, if, if it's not the Lord, <laughs> you'll be back in no time. <coughs> and you come back and you go, well, it was just a short-term mission trip. <laughs> okay, so, so Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. Um, uh, but in verse 14, he, he said that in response to verse 14. And the Pharisee, Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. Oh, what things? Uh, gosh, all, everything that in front of this, but if you went to verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least, that he's wanting you take care of the least and that proves you're of the kingdom and he'll give you more least to take care of if you will you know uh, but you should you should hear it all I don't have time to, to read it all but um, he's spelling out the kingdom and they didn't like it the Pharisees didn't like what he was preaching they didn't like his doctrine they didn't like his his thing and, and he says look the kingdom is being preached now and anybody that's going to be of it is going to press into it Okay, and anybody not of it is going to fight against it. All right, so um, so the Pharisees who were covetous heard all these things and they derided Jesus. Why? Because this gospel, this Christ crucified, is foolishness. Nobody in their right mind is going to die that others may gain, is going to give up so that others might get, is going to, only Jesus and only those who are being conformed to the image of Christ will even want to do that. I mean, if before, before Christ began to be formed in me, somebody just said, well, this is what you're supposed to do, and, you know, and, and put it in terms of, like, commandments instead of life, I would have gone, ah, and ran the other direction, you know. I mean, when I first got saved, my idea of what was going to happen was I was going to get saved. I went, I did go to Bible school. I was going to graduate, and I was going to be a great evangelist. And what, what I meant by that was I was going to have a, a BMW and a big house and a lot of followers, and people would, you know, and people would really like me. That's what I'm talking about. You know, had I got a glimpse to where I am now, I would have said, really, this is it? After this many years? You know, well, you're not a good shepherd. You know, you're not a good pastor. You've had more people. 
But I didn't know. And I had to grow in Jesus and realize that if I can just be faithful with whatever he gives me, he'll take care of the rest. My goal isn't to get more. My goal is to satisfy the Father by Christ in me. That's it. It's very simple. Okay. And, I'm, and I'm okay with that. But I wouldn't have been my first year of being saved. I would have looked at that and said, I failed miserably. You know what I mean? And that's, that's Jesus' end. Boy, you blew it, man. You failed. Look, you, you talked about all this great stuff and look at you. You know? What about Joseph and all your dreams, your visions that you had that you said God gave you, you know? All this is going to happen. And here you're in the lowest dungeon in Egypt. And you were brought here by Ishmaelites. And you were picked up from the Ishmaelites because your brothers beat you up and threw you in a pit. You go, well, I, don't, I can't jive the two, but... I know that I have to be faithful on this journey. Faithful to the life that God has given me. <clears throat> All right. So, they view this gospel as foolishness. Men justify their covetousness for the final life. Because he's talking about losing to gain and all this. And they're going, I don't like this. And they start deriding him and making fun of Jesus. And uh, so they justify their covetousness for the finer life. And, and uh, let me make sure I'm in the right spot here. Men justify their covetousness for the finer life, but the mentality related to what they highly esteem is the exact opposite of Christ crucified. In his eyes, it is not just wrong in terms of breaking a commandment, it is an abomination. And that's verse 15. This is Jesus. And Jesus said unto them, You are they who justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So you're justifying yourself so that you can keep your stuff because you're self-centered and Christ, you're not Christ-centric. You're trying to gain with you in mind instead of putting Jesus first at whatever cost. And so you're justifying all that so it won't sound too bad. And he said, because what is highly esteemed among men, he didn't just say is not esteemed by God. He said it's an abomination. Why? Okay, so let's go back to the first one that we talked about. Jesus said, you know, for the Gentiles, they seek house and clothes and, you know, to be taken care of and whatever. But you, with you, it shouldn't be that way. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Okay. It's not, it's not because they're, they're seeking horrible things. It's not even about the things. It's about the spirit or the government that governs you. Either, either yourself is first or you're governed by the Spirit of Christ. Okay? So he says, self, even if it's only picking, you know, small things for itself, still is self at the center. And he says, self, you know, and, you know, later on, 10 years from now, you may feed that, and, it, and it'll be a horrible self. You know what I mean? That would shoot somebody just because they like their shoes and take them. You know. But right now, the manifestation is only this small. But God says, what is that is still this, or is the potential is all there because the nature or the government is all there in you. And so only what is Christ is not an abomination unto me. Because he will never, ever sit on that throne as a, as a glorious um, potentate. He will sit on that throne as a slain lamb. Always. Amen. He'll always be a selfless, scarred, 
nail-scarred lamb that gave up his rights for all of them that are before him. He'll always be there. He won't get to a certain juncture and say, okay, I'm tired of this life now. I'm ready to have some things for myself. That's us. You know, I deserve better. Can you see Jesus saying that? I deserve better than this. Really, you do? I mean, I, I'm thinking of us now. Really? Do we really deserve better? We deserve hell. We deserve eternal damnation. But we don't see it that way. We go, well, I'm a Christian now. You know, like I always quote, we're, we say, I'm a child of the king. No, you're not. Jesus is the king and you're not Jesus' child. You're the father's child. So you will never be a child of the king. You're a child of the father. <coughs> Jesus is your brother. All right. <coughs> Let's see if we can get one more in and then we will stop. And this is Luke 19. There was really a lot more in that last bunch of scriptures, but if you if you get a chance, you should look at it. Luke 19 and verse starting in verse 10. Um for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. <clears throat> and, as, and as they heard these things, he added and spoke a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Okay. So Jesus is teaching this stuff on the way to Jerusalem where he knows he's about to die. He's going to give himself up. They didn't murdered Jesus. Jesus was a sacrifice, a willing sacrifice. Okay, He's already spelled out what's going to happen when he gets there. They don't get it. They think that the kingdom of God, what they picture the kingdom of God is going to appear. And here's their version of the kingdom of God now. Their version of the kingdom of God is that Jesus or the Messiah, whoever that is, is going to come down here and he's going to beat up all their enemies and he's going to set them all on thrones and he's going to make them all rich and happy and glorious and he's going to make everybody come and bow down before them and say, you're, you're wonderful and you're everything and, and, uh, and, and they're going to sit on those thrones going, we deserve this because we followed God when it wasn't easy. And that's what they think is going to happen. Am I right or wrong? That's what they thought. Now, Jesus... His version of the kingdom of God is that he's going to, by that nature and spirit, give himself on the cross. And he has spelled that out all the way through up to this point of what the kingdom of God is likened unto. He has said it over and over, and they've never heard him. They think that this other thing is going to happen. And here's the kicker. It's not. Jesus is going to live. Remember, he's the one who said, now he that is first is going to be last, but he that's last will be first. So he's going to put himself last. He's not, you know, uh, the, he just said the Pharisees, they justify themselves, but he's going to be that Isaiah 53 sheep that's, that before sh uh, shearers is dumb, who opens not his mouth. He doesn't say, look, I'm the son of God. You guys are making a mistake and, you know, I'm going to have my angel, you know, and he said that. I could have called 10,000 angels looking, uh, um, you know, and Peter took a thing and said, let's stand up for Jesus. Cut a guy's ear off, and Jesus doesn't rebuke the people that are coming to kill him. He rebukes Peter. He says, put that thing away. He picks up the guy's ear and puts it back on. He goes, if that was me, I'd have gone, what the heck are you doing here? I'm standing up for you here, man. This is kingdom stuff. I got a sword, and we're... I'm ready to take them. Come on, people. Come on. You know, a little old cliff mixed in there. <laughs> um, well, that was Peter's spirit. That's, this is what the, the kingdom is about to appear. I know it is. I know it is. And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was of this world, we would fight for it. My kingdom is of another spirit. And another way. Okay. So he lets them take him, you know. I mean, 
Folks, if God did not want to be taken and crucified, God could have easily stopped it. Mm -hmm. Just think about that. Mm -hmm. That's the spirit of the kingdom right there, <coughs> the selfless giving. All right. So um, let's see. Did I finish out my verses here? Um, Okay, verse 12. And he said, Therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. All right. <coughs> so, um, let me just read this to you. Jesus in verse 10 told them he came to save them by making himself their ransom. That's verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek to save that which is lost. He said, he's saying, look, I've come to be the ransom for you. You know, if, if, somebody, if, if, if somebody got taken and then they said, well, we, we need a ransom or something and you were able to be that ransom, you said, look, take me and let them go. And, and whatever you wanted to do to them, do it to me. That's what Jesus is saying. That's how he began this whole thing. And, um, and he's saying this as they're getting close to Jerusalem. That's Calvary's right there. That's what's on his mind. What's on their mind. The next verse. They thought the kingdom was going to appear and they definition of the kingdom is wrong therefore they're all deceived therefore they're all confused at what's going on okay only one person not confused jesus okay because he knows what the kingdom's about and he knows what he's come to do <coughs> all right so jesus in verse 10 told them he came to save them by making himself their ransom in verse 11 he gives the disciples his state of mind before the triumphal entry. He's about to come into Jerusalem and they're all going to be laying down palm leaves and going, Hosanna to the king. And he's saying, I've come as a ransom for you. They don't have a clue. You know, they're not of one mind, one accord. They're not of one spirit. They're not of, of one nature at this point. They're off on some grand, glorious thing because self wants to be delivered from every problem and wants God to set them up on a throne and wants all their enemies to bow down to him. It's, it's, the, it's the same all over. It's the same all over. Um, they thought he would set up a glorious kingdom, therefore he gave them a parable. A father sent a son to introduce a new kind of kingdom. It was about crucified living. Give away to gain an increase, and that's what he talks about, the, the pound or the, the talent that he gave them. And so one takes it, and he puts it to usury, meaning in a certain sense he, he lost it, but he gained more back. And another one does something else and, and makes some back. But one takes what he has, and he hides it because he doesn't realize that it's not just about don't hide what God gave you, but there's a principle of the kingdom. Put it out there in a manner that it looks like it's lost. Cast your bread upon the water, and after many days it'll come back to you. Okay? Put it out there in that spirit, and there will be an increase. Well, they didn't like that. And to them, this was a kingdom thing. You're telling us this is the way we're supposed to run our lives now? What was their words? But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Okay, so instead of the people receiving him and his way, they hated him and his kingdom method. That is exactly what their hatred was about because their response was, we will not have this man reign over us. In other words, they did not simply reject the man they rejected the way of his government. It was, it's contrary to human nature. It's contrary to the flesh. We're contrary to the Lord 
That's why he gave his Christ, aren't they? Glory to God. I mean, if you ever realize how contrary we are, you will rejoice evermore, you know, that Christ is your life. You just go, oh, thank God. There's hope. Christ in me is that hope. There's hope then that I won't always be selfish, that all my decisions won't just be something that I'm looking to turn back to me. Thank God. All right. So, um, I think we might have time for just, let's look in uh, Luke 21 and first verse 10. Then said he unto them, this is Jesus speaking, this is uh, Luke 21, 10. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Okay. Not just nation against nation, but what? Kingdom, kingdom against kingdom. Okay, now let's go to verse 31. So also ye, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is near at hand. Okay. All right, well, what is it talking about coming to pass? Well, all this bad stuff is going to happen. All this stuff. He says, men's hearts failing them for the things that are coming on earth. But you lift up your eyes to your salvation at hand. When you see this stuff coming, you know that the kingdom of God has come. This is, you know, when you see all these major upheavals and, and uh, uh, all this stuff and all this, this beast rising up in power and, and taking advantage of everybody, just know that the opportunity to ma manifest the kingdom is at hand. Okay, well, where do you get that from? Well, there, Randy. Well, I get it from the book of Revelation. All you got to do is go through the book of Revelation carefully. And if you do, what you're going to find out is that over and over, when it talks about the people of God in the book of Revelation, they lose. No, no, you have to do it. Check it out. They lose, but they don't lose. They lay down their life. And life comes out of death. And if you really read it, if you honestly really go in there and read it, you'll be shocked because, I mean, I, when I was reading it really with that in mind, thinking about that, I went, my God, every time it looks like we're going to do something, you know, uh, it's, you know, it, uh, it seems like the enemy ends up winning, but he doesn't win. It's always a situation where they are saying life comes out of death and uh, what is it, the, uh, the blood of the martyrs is the seeds of the church and, uh, and to realize that through uh, the in whatever the enemy can do to you, you know, and, and people get, you know, people that were in um, Krakow and some of these places, you know, some of the people there say, where's God? Where is God? Right there in that place, when God doesn't stop the Germans and stop you know, the Nazis and stop Hitler from all of this atrocity, where is, there, where is God? Well, it's right there in Betsy, who's laying down her life, who is in all the, you know, the, what is it, the hiding place. And it's right there in others that their names were never mentioned. It's right there in the book of Hebrews where it says, uh, first part of Hebrews 11, well, they won all these battles and stuff, but the last part says, but others, others who would not receive deliverance that they might have a greater resurrection and others who suffered sore chains and this and that. He talks about all the stuff they went through and didn't get deliverance and he says, of whom the world is not worthy. He didn't say that of the ones that got deliverance and the victories in their time. He said that of the ones that were like Christ, that were willing at whatever cost to themselves for others that this kingdom would spread and go, and it does, and it does, and it does, you know. And so, let's see, let me, let me just finish reading this then. Um, well, that's what I said right there. When you see these things coming, know that the time is here to manifest the kingdom. So also ye, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is near at hand. It's that here is the opportunity for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah.
Anyway, okay, so <coughs> all that I've shared is pretty much worthless either in itself or, or even if it was the best gold ever if you don't get into the scriptures and make sure that's what it says of the Bereans in the book of Acts. He said, it says that they search the scriptures to find out whether those things that Paul was teaching was of God or not. Okay. Be a Berean. Be from Berea. Be a Berean. In, what is it? Acts 17, 11. And, and search the word. Don't believe me. Don't just listen to me. Don't just assume that what I'm telling you is right. Maybe it is right, but it's not right for you if you don't get it. Do you understand what I mean? It's, it, it could be absolutely gloriously of God, and you still need to search it out and see it from the Lord for yourself. Or it could be the biggest bunch of heresy that's ever been taught, and you need to know that, and you need to test everything I say by the word of God. And I'm okay with that. And, you're, and I'm okay with you challenging me on the word. If you go, well, you know, well, what about this? Because, folks, there are a lot of whatabouts because we, ha we haven't seen the whole meaning of the whole Bible yet. So, so keep, you know, was there, there was a commercial, it was a beer commercial, I think, and it said, stay thirsty, my friends. Well, I'm saying stay hungry, my friends. <laughs> hungry for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word and your son and the Holy Spirit that is here in us and in our midst to break the bread of life to us. Father, help us to see Jesus. Lord, help us to approach it like eating watermelon, to eat the good part and spit out the seeds, to find you, though, Lord, and not stumble over the part that isn't you. Lord, help us to know you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We need you and we desire you in our hearts. We cry out. We cry out for more of you. So Holy Spirit, be the best friend that we could ever have. Cause us to decrease and Christ to increase. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed. Bless